Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the globe who are attending today's webinar, the eighth in the series that was launched four months ago by the World Commission on Environmental Law, or WCEL, of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Welcome and aloha from my home in Hawaii. My name is Denise Antolini. I'm the Deputy Chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law and a Professor of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa William S. Richardson School of Law. On behalf of the World Commission on Environmental Law, I want to express my gratitude to the speakers and to all participants who have joined us today for this eighth webinar in the WCEL webinar series. This is also the second in a new series jointly sponsored with WCEL's partner, the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. This two-part high-level series is entitled Recent Developments in European Environmental Law Jurisprudence. The first part, Webinar 7, was held on August 28, 2020, and you can obtain a recording of that webinar by going to the World Commission on Environmental Law webpage. I will be introducing you to WCEL and covering some logistics for about five minutes before turning it over to Justice Antonio Benjamin, the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law. And then he will turn it over to our distinguished moderator for today's session, the Honorable Advocate General Eleanor Sharpston from the Court of Justice of the European Union. She will then introduce the speakers and manage the rest of the webinar for the next hour and a half. The World Commission on Environmental Law is one of six expert volunteer commissions of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. WCEL is a volunteer network of environmental law and policy experts from all regions of the world who volunteer their knowledge and services to IUCN activities and other partners. We have over 1,300 members, many of whom are attending today's webinar, and we have over 250 registered participants today from all regions of the world. And you can always go to the WCEL webpage for updates, news, resources, a series of lectures on environmental law from distinguished experts, and the past webinars. Today, we are very honored, as I mentioned, to co-host this session with our sister organization, the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, and Justice Benjamin will speak more about the Institute in just a minute. I also want to acknowledge the three key founders of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment who helped to organize this two-part series with such amazing speakers. Justice Benjamin, Lord Robert Carnwath, and Dr. Luke Lavrisen. Uh, both Justice Carnwath and uh, Dr. Luke Lavrisen spoke in, uh, at the first webinar a, a week ago. So we thank all of them for proposing this webinar series and inviting an outstanding lineup of speakers. WCEL and the Global Judicial Institute collaborate with many partners on many professional educational initiatives. Uh, as many of you know, we were planning to host in March 2020 the Second World Environmental Law Congress, along with partners such as the United Nations Environment Program. We had a full week of events planned in Rio de Janeiro. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, like many organizations around the world, we had to postpone our Congress to a future date. So keep in touch and we will announce a new date as soon as, it's, uh, as soon as we can. You're probably also aware that the IUCN, for the same reasons, had to postpone the World Conservation Congress that would have been in Marseille in June 2020 and it will now be in January 2021 in Marseille. So please check back. Um, Things are constantly changing and we are adapting. And that's my next point. With these major World Conservation Congresses postponed, our conservation community and our entire field of environmental law, we have had to innovate to meet these unimaginable challenges. So this webinar series was designed to keep you connected, to keep the momentum going toward a better world and to improve our field of law. So working with our members, partners and colleagues, non-lawyers, lawyers around the world, we want to continue these conversations and build capacity, share our expertise with each other, and continue to press forward on a just transformation of conservation law and policy. 
So today's webinar, we hope, uh, keeps that inspiration alive and keeps us moving in the right direction. Even if we can't get together physically, we can certainly get together in such wonderful formats like this. Let me explain a few logistics um, before concluding. So in this Zoom webinar, there are two key functions for participants to keep an eye on. One is the chat box. So for participants, if you go to the bottom of your screen now and click on chat box, you can see there that we will be posting information and links from time to time during the webinar. So we will communicate to you occasionally um, with information in that chat box. For you to communicate with us, you want to use the Q&A function also at the bottom of your screen. So you can go ahead and open that now, just click on it now, and at any time, you can put a question in there. Uh, you can also alert us about any technical issues and we'll do our best to, to work with you. But that, that Q&A box allows us to accumulate questions for the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. So you won't get your answers uh, right away, but certainly we'll be looking at all of them and trying to select the most appropriate and best ones for, for the end of the webinar. Uh, let me mention too that today's webinar is being recorded so that we can share it. So we will share the recording, the PowerPoints and other materials in about one week with everyone who has registered and then we'll post it on our website so it can be shared broadly. And we encourage you to share this series with, with anyone. Uh, it is intended to be a public educational resource. Every webinar has a, a team behind it that's um, putting it all together in addition to the presenters that you see. Uh, soon I will fade into the background and, and help manage the, the back end of the webinar, but I want to acknowledge the assistance today of two amazing women who you also not, not see uh, during the webinar, but who are working very hard to make it happen. Emily Gaskin, an environmental lawyer, is the executive officer for the World Commission on Environmental Law. And she will be, a, she's already uh, does the preparation for the webinars and manages the, the whole process and is, does an extraordinary job. And Miranda Steed is a recent LLM graduate of Pace University Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Hawaii, William S. Richardson School of Law, and now is practicing in Honolulu. She's also in the background helping us to manage the webinar today, and we thank them both. In addition to Emily and Miranda, we have a wonderful team of four professional interpreters, and we're very pleased to be able to offer interpretation in the IUCN languages for this webinar series. So Etienne Van Damme and Claude Arrault are providing interpretation in French, and Camila Oyan and Jorge Milazzo are providing interpretation in Spanish. If you have not already turned on your interpretation and you need it, look for the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select the language of your choice. Again, we're most grateful to the interpreters today. Last, I must add that the views expressed today uh, represent the individual speaker's views and they not any official position of the World Commission on Environmental Law or the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment or the IUCN. This is purely educational and, and we hope inspirational. Now I'm very pleased and honored to introduce my dear friend and colleague Justice Antonio Benjamin, the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law for the past eight plus years. <laughs> Justice Benjamin is on the High Court of Brazil, the STJ, and a world-recognized jurist and leader in the field of environmental law. He will join us now for about five to 10 minutes of opening remarks. Antonio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Well, first of all, let me say that I'm very pleased with this uh, second piece of our webinar on judges and the environment. The focus, as uh, we know, in this first one is on the European situation. But of course, each one of the topics that will be addressed here today have relevance to other parts of the world. The protection 
of habitats. This is important in Europe and it is equally important in the Arctic and the tropical forests of the world, including the Amazon and the Congo Basin um, uh, forest. The second topic on air quality. If this is important in Europe, imagine in mega cities like Sao Paulo, Mexico City, New Delhi, uh, Johannesburg, Nairobi, uh, just to, to mention four or five of the big cities of, uh, of the world. And it's a topic that will be with us not just in its um, more traditional uh, feature as contamination of the air, but also in this uh, new perspective of air pollution, including things that in the past we didn't consider pollution at all, uh, emission of CO2, uh, for example. Then climate change litigation. This is probably the most complex area for us judges uh, at present. We don't know much about it. It's something relevant in Europe, but also in other parts of the world. We do have already precedents in several countries in which climate change was addressed either directly or indirectly. Finally, we have the strict protection or strict species protection. This is the biodiversity dilemma that we are facing in many parts of the world. In tropical forests, for example, we have no idea of how many species we are losing every day because we don't have a full picture of the species of flora and fauna that exist in those magnificent um, biomes. So we have a very diverse uh, group uh, of topics. There are many, many, many more topics that we could have included. The difference to me between this second lag and the first lag uh, of our joint webinar is that in this second one, we have more of an academic analysis of the work and the challenge that we judges face. In the first one, we, we had three judges uh, that either spoke or chaired. Here, uh, the, the, the discussion will be in the hands of those that are experts working with judges or in, academ in, in the academic uh, world. As the founding uh, um, member of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, it is important to mention to our members around the world that the, this first two set of webinars focusing on Europe is uh, just the beginning. We intend to organize similar events focusing on Latin America, on the Pacific islands or small uh, island states, on Africa and Africa, common law Africa and civil law Africa, la francophonie. So don't think that we are beginning with Europe and ending with Europe. The reason why we begin with Europe and not with Latin America, for example, since I am Brazilian, is that we have partnered for those two events uh, with the European um, um, Union Forum of Judges for the Environment that is chaired by um, my dear friend, my brother, uh, Professor and Justice uh, Luc Lavrissen, also a founding member of the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment. So many thanks to Professor Denise Antolini that uh, has not just organized everything, 
but is willing to wake up at 4 a.m. in Honolulu in order to join us. This is, uh, this is very telling uh, about Denise and her commitment to environmental law education, not just for judges, but for uh, everyone in, in the world. I would like also to echo Denise and thank the WCL small team, particularly um, Emily Gaskin and Miranda Steed. Uh, it's a, a small group of people that are really dedicated and make all this uh, possible. My final word of gratitude is to the speakers that have agreed to join us today and especially Advocate General Eleanor Sharpston. I have, I have heard so much about her and we are delighted uh, that at, at least virtually uh, using the technology, we can um, share uh, this space dedicated to judges and to environmental law learning. I am delighted again, I repeat myself just for the sake of emphasis to see this second um, leg of our webinar and I'm sure that it will be as successful as the first one. Thank you all. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, Denise uh, Antolini, for your, for your general introduction. Justice Benjamin, muito obrigado, senhor. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I personally am sorry that I'm meeting you only virtually because I spent four happy years as a child growing up in Brazil, and I have saudades do Brasil. Yeah. So uh, it, if you are, <laughs> if someone is able to translate saudades yes oh saudade, that's difficult that's very that difficult the, <laughs> yeah it means that this person is in the spirit of the language just not in the technicality the linguistic aspect of the language so many thanks thank you ladies and gentlemen over the months since march 2020 since the COVID-19 pandemic really started to take hold and the lockdowns in individual countries started to happen. Over those months, we have all moved into a very strange parallel universe. We no longer, all of us, get into our cars or into trains or into buses to commute to and from our work five days or more every week. All right, some of us are very virtuous, I know. We drive electric cars. Maybe we get into electric trains or electric buses. But there are still many, many of us who at least some of the time rely on vehicles that pollute from petrol, from diesel, in order to get back and forth from our offices. And we haven't been doing that during the pandemic. There are sectors of the economy, particularly heavy industry, that have virtually shut down for a while with all their associated pollution. And that has perhaps reminded us of the uncomfortable truth that a very large percentage of our, and I put quotations around it, our normal economic activity has environmental implications and not all of those implications are particularly friendly. So instead of getting into our car or our bus or our train, we've been at home. We've of course been working, we've been teleworking. But while we've been teleworking, perhaps you've been doing like me, perhaps you've been organizing yourself so that your virtual office is, well, in as nice a place as you can make it. My virtual office, where I'm sitting at the moment, is in a kind of patio that's outside my house, 
So I'm in fact half in my garden. And of course, that's wonderful because it makes you aware of the nature that is around you. You see small animals scurrying across. You watch the birds come down and feed and just be there. And of course, with less cars and less buses and so on, it's, it's possible to hear the bird song in the morning. That's rather nice as well. And well, the mention was made by Denise Antolini about unfortunately having to cancel a planned meeting. I think we've all had that experience over the last months. And perhaps we've noticed that this means that we haven't been leaping on and off planes the whole time to get to the next conference and then come back to our normal place of work and then go off as we so proudly say at the court, je pars en mission, I am going off on a mission. Somehow it sounds better in French. It sounds as though it's kind of got a, a sacred purpose to it. Whereas in English, it sounds a bit pompous to say I'm going on mission. But we've, we've stopped doing that. We've discovered that we can have these meetings via Zoom and other software platforms. And we, we've really discovered a sort of different forgotten world when we get out again. When we have started venturing cautiously, obviously a few of us at the time, and being very careful to, to wear our masks and to respect social distancing, we found a strange thing has happened. You go into city centers and you know, there's very little smog. There's very little air pollution. And then I saw some pictures of the Grand Lagoon in Venice and I blinked because you could see through the, into the water. I mean, the water wasn't completely obscured anymore. It was really almost blue. And I have never seen the water in Venice looking like that. And I think perhaps some of us began to wonder whether we wouldn't perhaps rather like to have a world that looked like this. Now, I've deliberately told it as a narrative, but those of us who are interested in and who care about environmental law, we should regard this as a straight bonus from something that has been produced by COVID-19 and it's a bonus, whereas COVID-19 in other respects has had such horrendous and tragic and very negative consequences. But a positive consequence of what we have been experiencing over the last few months is this change, this beneficial change to our environment. And the consequence that citizens may have woken up a bit to environmental law. They may perhaps have realized that environmental law is not something which is, well, it has to be left to the technical specialists who can understand how to work out all the equations that are in the technical annexes to the EU directives. It may have persuaded citizens that if they want to have a cleaner and more environmentally friendly world and one in which there is biodiversity and in which we share this planet with other species, that actually they should get out there and do something about it, which takes you straight on to all the issues of the mechanisms by which environmental law is enforced. It takes you through, first and foremost, to access to justice questions. We were very proud, I think, in the European world when we had the Aarhus Convention. We thought, right, this is it. We're getting in there. This is important. And then we watched it being implemented in national law and in my case, I watched it being implemented in EU law. And we began to realize, to see just how complicated it is. The basic issue of locus standi, what are the tests that have to be satisfied in order to get in through the door of the court and explain that something bad is going on. And we also saw the vital role that concerned citizens and that NGOs, and that NGOs, non-governmental organizations, 
can play in patrolling and in enforcing environmental law. I want to wind up these very introductory remarks with a wider thought, which is that as a professional lawyer, I know that the law needs to evolve. And of course, we have big issues that are out there, not only climate change, but first and foremost climate change that we need to think about. And I want to draw a parallel with what happened in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, when we realized that human rights law had been inadequate, and when the crime of genocide was invented. I say invented, it wasn't there before, but it was brought into the repertoire of law, and the mere threat that you know, there was such a thing as genocide, and if you behaved really appallingly and things went wrong, you might be accused of it, has helped to prevent the recurrence of some of the unspeakable horrors we saw during that period. Well, we have an equivalent idea for environmental law, which is starting to gain traction, the idea of ecocide. It's not there yet, it's not fully accepted yet, but it's what I would describe as potentially a big crime to address a big problem. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to thank you for listening to those very broad and very general and abstract thoughts. And I am going to move across to introducing our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker who will be talking to us about the case law of the court in which I serve, the Court of Justice of the European Union, on the protection of habitats and on the Natura 2000 program. Our speaker for this is Dr. Charles Hubert Bourne, who is a professor of law at the University of Louvain, where he holds courses in public law and land use planning law. He's also a member of the Seminary of Environmental and Land Use Planning Law of the Faculty of Law and of the Biodiversity Research Center. And his research focuses on biodiversity conservation law. Dr. Bourne, you have the floor. Thank you very much um, for inviting me to, to this webinar. I'm, I'm uh, very proud to, to, to share with you some thoughts about the uh, recent case law of the Court of Justice of the European uh, Union on, uh, on uh, habitats protection and specifically uh, on the Natural 2000 network, which is, which is the, the flagship of biodiversity conservation uh, policy in the European Union. So um, after a short introduction on Natura 2000, I will present the most important recent developments in the case law of the Court of Justice. My aim is um, to highlight a very active role played by the court in ensuring the effectiveness of the regime set up by the directives and in ensuring that the member states do not circumvent their obligations. So, um, as an introduction, um, the conservation of nature is governed, as you know, in European law by two early directives, uh, namely, um, sorry, um, the Birds Directive adopted in uh, 1979 and codified in uh, 20, uh, 2009, and the Habitats Directive um, in, adopted in 92. Their objectives are to ensure the conservation of all species of European wild birds and to maintain or restore to a favorable conservation status, natural habitat types and species of uh, community interest. These directives uh, structure nature conservation and um, policy into two main pillars, sorry. The Natura 2000 network on the one hand and species protection on the other. I will focus on the first. Natura 2000, as, as I said, is the flagship of EU uh, biodiversity policy. It is a coherent European ecological network made up of two types of protected areas. Namely, on the one hand, special protected areas, SPAs, provided for by the Birds Directive. And 
On the other hand, spe special areas of conservation, SACs, provided, by, um, provide, provided for by the Habitats Directive. These two types of areas are commonly referred to as Natura 2000 sites and benefit from a largely unified conservation regime. The ecological coherence of the network is ensured by the obligations uh, for member states to select and designate as SPAs or SACs the most appropriate sites on the basis of scientific criteria. Member states may not exclude sites for socioeconomic criteria or reasons. The Commission, the European Commission, is closely involved in the procedure for the selection and designation of SACs. It also monitors the completeness of uh, SPA's network proposed by the member states to ensure the coherence of the network. The Natura 2000 network currently comprises, includes more than 27,000 terrestrial and marine sites covering respectively 17.9% of the EU's land territory and more than 5% of its marine territory. It's, very, it's a very extensive uh, network. The conservation of Natura 2000 sites is ensured by a coherent set of management and protection provisions brought together in Article 6 of the Habitats Directive, to which I shall return in a moment. However, however by its very nature, the Habitats Directive is drafted in general terms, sometimes imprecisely, and even lacks detail on a number of important issues, like the possibility of designating sites for restoration measures, possibilities of removing or decommissioning or declassifying your site from the network, the scope of the obligation to take necessary conservation measures in the uh, special area of conservation, the nature of the projects covered by the appropriate impact assessment mechanism I will uh, focus on later. The possibility of taking into account compensatory or mitigating measures to assess the risk of significant effect or damage to the integrity of the Natura 2000 sites. Or the scope um, of the concept of imperative reasons of uh, overriding public interest. Uh, of socioeconomic uh, nature that allows for exceptions or derogation to site protection rules. The court has um, had the, the, the opportunity in judgments handed down on preliminary, preliminary rulings or infringement proceed, proceedings to reduce these imprecisions and to fill these gaps by a strict and teleological interpretation of the directives. The court demonstrates here a constancy in its will to give to Natural 2000 regime its full effectiveness and to prevent member states for, from circumventing their conservation obligations. It does not, the court does not hesitate to draw from the provisions of the directive obligations uh, on the part of the national authorities that do not appear explicitly in the text. It relies in particular, in particular on what might be called an ecosystem interpretation, ecosystemic interpretation of the conservation objectives pursued by the both directives and on the precautionary principle. It has also interpreted uh, the notion of provisional measures broadly so as to be able to act effectively in uh, interim pro measures uh, proceedings against member states that deliberately destroy the Natural 2000 sites in violation of the uh, European law. However, the strict interpretation of directives by the court can sometimes thwart a more flexible or an, and conciliatory approach to nature conservation at the risk of slowing down the acceptance of constraints by economic operators. I will now mention a few recent decisions to illustrate my point without any concern for completeness completeness. And if I'm short of time, uh, I will make a selection. First on the evolution of the Natura 2000 network. The Natura 2000 network is not a rigid network. It has to live, it has to extend or to be um, reduced uh, according to scientific criteria. The court clarified a gray area in the directive relating to the removal from the network of a site selected by the commission as a site of, um, uh, of community importance. This clarification should also apply to, 
to the declassification of uh, an uh, a SCA from the network. In its Vereniging Uxwaarts Landscape judgment uh, of uh, 2017, the court accepted the possibility to withdraw a site selected as a site of community importance due to a scientific error subject to parallelism of procedures. It had already recognized this in relation to an SPA, a bird protected area, in two cases, Commission versus France and Commission versus Portugal. However, it specifies here that the margin of appreciation for this withdrawal is solely scientific. It can only take place with a reinforced burden of proof and convergent conclusions of the member states and the commissions as to the lack of interest of the parcels of the, the, the land concerned for the achievement of the conservation objectives of the site concerned. This clarification is important in view of the temptation for member states to downgrade a site or to withdraw a site for scientific error, of course. On the other hand, incidentally, the court confirmed in the same judgment that plots of land which do not currently host the species or habitat concerned, but which are of importance for their conservation through restoration work, can or even must be included and maintained in the Natura 2000 network. This is not explicitly, this is not explicitly, explicitly sorry, stated in the text of the directive, and uh, it's an important, in my opinion, clarification given the importance of restoring um, European biodiversity. On the management of sites, oh sorry, um, on the management of sites, um, we can uh, remind to listeners that Article 6 is the cornerstone of the Natura 2000 network uh, regime in that it imposes a comprehensive and coherent uh, conservation regime on Natura 2000 sites. And its first paragraph establishes an active site management component requiring member states to I quote, to establish for each zone the necessary conservation measures which meet the ecological requirements of the habitats and species um, present on the site concerned. And um, this was stated in, uh, by the, the, the court in its bylaw visa uh, case law. Um, the court stated that these obligations must be implemented effectively and by complete, clear and precise measures. Um, and a management plan of general or indicative scope is not enough. The system must systematically include conservation measures based on the ecological requirements of each species and habitat site present in each of the site concerned. The court also specified that the compensatory measures in the event of derogatory infringement of a site cannot constitute the conservation measures referred to in Article 6.1. This is also interesting to know. Um, but the most uh, recent case law was focusing on uh, the cornerstone of the protection regime, protection regime of natural 2000 sites. The Article 6.3 and Article 6.4 of the Habitats Directive, which sets up um, um, an appropriate impact assessment mechanism. Um, which is based on a test of the compatibility of plans and projects with the conservation objectives of the site. I mean, this is, means um, with the conservation uh, of the species and the habitats for which the site has been designated. The mechanism revolves around, on the one hand, an appropriate assessment of the impacts of, uh, uh, of the plan or project in the light of those conservation objectives, and on the other hand, on the obligation for the authority to refuse the plan or project if there is a risk to the integrity of the site, unless an exemption is granted at very strict conditions. This requirement is applied quite unevenly by member states uh, due to the lack of precision in the directive on the scope of this provision. However, the court has developed a very strict uh, jurisprudence uh, in order to prevent member states from circumventing their protection obligations. First, it interprets, the court interprets the scope of the mechanism very broadly through the notion of project or plan, beyond the notion of project or plan within the meaning of the more restrictive um, SEA or EIA directives. The only criterion retained 
here is the risk of a significant effect on the Natura 2000, 2000 site with regard to its conservation objective. It thus, it thus um, admitted that projects within the meaning of Article 6.3 constitute projects. The spreading of the application of manure or fertilizers, fertilizers or cattle grazing. Although these activities do not really physically alter the site in its cooperative mobilization for the environment uh, case. Also, a Belgian law ordering the restart of a nuclear installation and delaying by 10 years the planned date for ending nuclear power generation has been considered as a project uh, under Article 6.3. So, um, there are a very broad scope for this concept of project and plan. Second, in a complex case concerning the Dutch program for atmospheric nitrogen deposition, um, the, the PASS, the Court of Justice also clarified the conditions under which a proper and appropriate impact assessment of a national program can justify the authorization, the individual permit of a fertilization uh, of a fertilizers application project without an individualized impact assessment on the basis of that program, of course, at strict condition. But this leaves open the possibility of, of considering a quite programmatic approach to project management, which is quite interesting. Third, um, the court requires an ecosystem approach in the analysis of the impacts of plans and projects on the site. In the Olohan case uh, relating to a bypass, uh, to a road uh, north of the city of Kilkenny in Ireland, the court specified that as part of the appropriate assessment, the authority must in particular analyze the impact on the, of the project, not only on the habitats and the species present on the site, but also uh, on those present outside the site, if this impact is likely to affect the conservation objectives of the site. For example, a prey species uh, or a, 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 a host species for reproduction, like for the muscle. This approach is very consistent with the notion of ecosystem integrity, which is at the, which is at the heart of the site's protection regime. Um, uh, another very interesting um, case law of the court uh, considers um, the, 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 the mitigation and compensatory uh, measures. And especially um, the court clarified the, the, the jurisprudence about the consideration of such measures, mitigation measures and compensatory measures uh, to determine the risk of significant effect of projects and plans of, uh, on a natural 2000 site. We know that in uh, former case law, Reels Orleans case, for example, the court ruled out that compensatory measures even if they are anticipated, could not be, cannot be taken into account to consider that a plan or a project is not likely to affect the integrity of a Natura 2000 site. It justifies this refusal by uh, the uncertain nature of the positive effects of these measures, which take several years to implement. Only compensatory measures whose positive effect is certain could possibly be taken into account, which might leave an opening for habitat banking uh, mechanism, for example. The court, I have nearly finished, the court has even gone further to ensure that member states do not attempt to evade their conservation obligations. In its people uh, over wind and sweetman decision, it ruled that mitigation measures, I mean here measures, the court means, means here measures aimed at avoiding or reducing the adverse effect of the plan of project on that site, those mitigation measures cannot be taken into account at the screening stage of the impact, uh, the appropriate impact assessment procedure to exempt the plan or project from appropriate assessment. On the other hand, on the other hand, the authority may take these measures into account to assess the risk of damage to the integrity of the site to the uh, exclusion of compensatory uh, measures. And to finish, um, a very important case has been, um, uh, has been uh, 
taken in, uh, in, uh, in, in a very specific uh, point, very important for the effectiveness of the regime, the adoption, the adoption of interim measures with penalty payments to prevent irreversible, irreversible damage to a Natura 2000 site. The court ruled in, on the use of interim measures to order the suspension of the execution of the Polish authorities' decision to authorize the large-scale exploitation of Europe's large, uh, last large primary forest. You all know the Bieloriza uh, Forest, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and a major Natura 2000 site in Europe. And in this case, the order uh, pronounced by the of course, uh, the court in Grand Chamber uh, marks a major step forward for European environmental law in that for the first time to our knowledge, the court makes use of the possibility of provisionally ordering the cessation of acts contrary to EU environmental law to order to avoid, um, in order to avoid uh, irreversible, irreversible ecological damage. By it was indeed a very major and important order. And I, yeah. think, I think you have probably persuaded all of your listeners that if they don't look up any other case in your so, slide, yes, they you should go that. and read that one. Thank it you. is a very major case. Thank you so much. I'm sorry Thank to you. cut you a bit short, but no, unfortunately, I, I, I do finished. need to. Thank you. I do Thank need you. to move on. Uh, our, our next speaker is Dr. Laura Burgers, uh, who's going to talk to us about climate change litigation and European private law. Uh, Dr. Burgers is a lecturer in private law at the Amsterdam Center for Transformative Private Law at the University of Amsterdam. Her PhD thesis explored the democratic legitimacy of judicial lawmaking in European private law cases on climate change. And she is especially interested in the rights of future generations and the rights of nature. So Dr. Burgers, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, I think, but thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a doctor yet uh, because I'm about to defend my thesis only uh, in November. At least that's what I hope because currently uh, the thesis is uh, at uh, the tables of the Reading Commission. But uh, thank you very much. I feel uh, very honored and pleased to speak at this uh, wonderfully organized event today. And uh, I want to address indeed climate change litigation in European private law. And I added a subtitle to my presentation, namely environmental constitutionalism and European civil courts. Because I think that the increasing presence of so-called environmental constitutionalism is one of the most interesting developments in uh, recent environmental jurisprudence. Um, Today I aim to embed this connection between environmental constitutionalism and climate change litigation into a theoretical framework, which I developed on the basis of the work of uh, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. I believe that such theoretical embedding helps us to better understand the significance of climate change litigation. I show that the climate cases can be viewed as contributions to the so-called public sphere, a submission that I will substantiate by drawing a parallel with uh, civil disobedience. Then I will demonstrate how environmental constitutionalism was furthered by climate change litigation in European private law, upon which my conclusions follow on the role of the judiciary in these cases. So uh, my story is based upon my PhD research entitled Justitia, the People's Power and Mother Earth. And um, um, this tricolon introduces the protagonist of my thesis. The first main character is Justitia, the judiciary who has to deal with claims on climate change. The second is the people's power, democracy, which should be the source of any democratically legitimate law. And the third is Mother Earth, the environment that those who initiate climate lawsuits are so concerned about. My topic is the democratic legitimacy, legitimacy of judicial lawmaking on climate change in European private law. Climate change is a politically hot issue, so should the judiciary at all have a say in it? 
in the thesis, I address inter alia the question to what extent the judiciary should protect those who are heavily impacted by climate change, but do not have a voice in our constitutional democracies, notably people abroad, future generations and non-human entities such as animals, plants and ecosystems. Today, I focus, however, on the theoretical framework of this thesis entitled Boundaries to Democratically Legitimate Judicial Lawmaking in European Private Law. Uh, a bit of a mouthful, but the chapter shows overlap with a paper with a, I think, better title that I uh, published recently, Open Access in the Journal Transnational Environmental Law, uh, because it's uh, entitled Should Judges Make Climate Change Law? And as I said, it's open access, so you can download it for free. Now, most probably all of you have already heard about climate change litigation. This phenomenon involves lawsuits about the question, who is responsible for climate change? And according to certain databases, over a thousand lawsuits worldwide are launched. In the area of European private law, I counted nine of these cases. I define European private law as rules of civil law and civil procedure in Europe, both at the national and the European level. When climate cases are brought to co court, and certainly in all European cases that I investigated, this leads often to controversy about the role of the judiciary within the separation of powers between the branches of government. For example, Shell responded to being sued by the Dutch NGO uh, Milieu Defensie about its climate policy as follows. It's also uh, written on the slide. We believe that climate change is a complex societal challenge that should not be addressed by courts. And also many academics find that climate change is a political issue that therefore should not be dealt with by the judiciary. In 2015, the Hague District Court uh, rendered its now world famous decision in the Urgenda case, Urgenda case, and it ordered the Dutch government, based on tort law, to make its policy, uh, climate policy more ambitious. But mostly in the Netherlands, numerous academics said that the court has overstepped its role in the governmental separation of powers. Such standpoints are not strange when looking closer at the essence of democratically legitimate lawmaking. In my research, I defined democratic legitimacy with the aid of the seminal book Facticität und Geltung by the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. In this masterpiece, Habermas reconstructs how we in Western democracies under the rule of law perceive the legitimacy of our own laws. Central is his democracy principle, which says, a bit oversimplified now for purposes of time, that those who are bound by the law must, must also be able to see themselves as the authors of the law. We can be such an author by entering into society-wide debates into something which he calls the public sphere. We can all participate in these debates, whether it is by writing an op-ed for a newspaper, walking in a protest march, or, for example, by sharing something topical on social media. Such contributions to the public sphere then seep towards the political institutions, such as parliament and government, who can then take final decisions on what the law should look like. Now, this conception of deliberative democracy, as it is called, implies boundaries to the role of the judge. judge. Judges should only apply laws, but not devise new laws. After all, we want to be bound by laws only that we made together in the democracy and not by law created by a single person. Also, not if that single person is a judge. There is, however, another vital element in Habermas' theory, and that is his so-called system of rights. The system of rights covers those rights that we know as fundamental, constitutional, or human rights. According to Habermas, a democracy can only function as long as the system of rights is protected. One can easily imagine this for those fundamental rights for protecting our so-called public autonomy. Uh, such as the right to freedom of expression, to association, or the right to vote. But Habermas, Habermas insists 
that the same is true for rights that protect our private autonomy, such as the rights to health or to housing. If I'm very sick or if I lack proper housing, I'm likely hindered to participate in the society-wide debate about what the law should look like. And this is what Habermas calls his co-originality thesis. Both public and private autonomy, as protected by the system of rights, are necessary conditions for the democracy as such. This means, in turn, that there is one instance where the judiciary may oppose decisions taken by a democratic majority, namely when fundamental rights are at stake. The judge must protect these rights to protect democracy as such. It is, however, not for the judiciary to determine the interpretation and the scope of fundamental rights, because this is something that happens rather in society at large. The judiciary must use the interpretations of fundamental rights that reign in the society-wide deliberations to maintain the democratic legitimacy of its decisions. Now, my analysis of climate change litigation against the background of this theoretical framework includes the observation that whilst climate change is, can be seen as aimed at judicial lawmaking primarily, it is secondarily also a contribution to the public sphere. And this can be illustrated by the photograph that I uh, put here on the slide, and it was taken just after the Dutch Court of First just after the Dutch court of first instance delivered its judgment in the Urgenda case. One of the lawyers behind this climate case, Roger Cox, burst out into tears upon hearing that he had won the case. Whilst he had always thought that he was legally right, his interpretation was the right one, and his primary, primary aim was to have the court to affirm this interpretation, he still did not accept this to happen, expected this to happen. The Urgenda case was also la launched to raise awareness about the climate problem. Now, to better understand the deliberative power of a climate lawsuit, allow me to make a comparison with, cli comparison with climate change related civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is usually defined as breaking the law to protest against its alleged illegitimacy. What you see here on the slide is a picture of something called the mass grave action. In the summer of 2016, an enormous heat wave was announced in Pakistan. It was so large that, um, that people already started to dig mass graves. At the same time, at another continent, namely in the United States of America, people wanted to protest a new gas pipeline. They laid down, in the trench that was dug for the pipeline to imitate dead people in mass graves in Pakistan. The activists reasoned not only that the new gas pipeline created significant risks for their own neighborhood, but also that the gas, uh, using the gas as fuel would generate pollution, which exacerbates climate change and causes more dangerous heat waves in countries like Pakistan they were in the end charged with trespassing. Now, such a, a action of civil disobedience has something in common with climate change litigation. That is, both civil disobedience and climate change litigations are directed primarily not at the political branch of government, but at the branches enforcing the law. They also form contributions to the public sphere, but only secondarily. This might become more clear when putting various types of contributions to the public sphere on a timeline. A regular contribution to the public sphere, say an op-ed or a protest march, is directed towards the legislative branch of government and says that we should change law in the future. By contrast, civil disobedience is directed to the branches of government enforcing the law, namely the police and the courts. Civilly disobedient protesters feel the issue is so pressing that there is no time left for political debate. They escalate by breaking the law, turning to the legal institution, saying that the law should change right now. Lastly, climate change litigation is, like civil disobedience, 
directed at the legal institutions. It is very different from civil disobedience in one respect. After all, where civil disobedience is breaking the law, climate change litigation puts forward the view that the law has already changed and that the judge merely needs to affirm this. This is a particularly strong contribution to the public sphere. The claim is that the political debate is over and that a new interpretation of the law has developed in society that can be applied by judges. These observations allow us to better understand a relatively recent development in climate change litigation, which was famously labeled a rights turn by Pio and Osofsky two years ago. That is, though those climate cases in which the environmentalists are winning usually rely on an argumentation built upon fundamental rights. The increasing attention for the environment in fundamental and human rights law is also known as environmental constitutionalism or global environmental constitutionalism. Remember Habermas co-originality thesis saying that only a fundamental right may legitimize judicial interference against a democratic majority. Now, what we see happening in the climate cases I researched is a push for the recognition that indeed the environment is a constitutional matter which therefore deserves judicial protection against political decisions uh, of the democratic majority. Uh, this uh, movement I call uh, a constitutionalization of the environment through the practice of civil courts in Europe, although the phenomenon stretches beyond the uh, boundaries of Europe. I will go through some highlights quickly. In 2015, the court of first instance rendered the Urgenda decision. There was an important role for articles two and eight of the European Convention of Human Rights, enshrining respectively the rights to life and private life. But these human rights were applied only indirectly because the legal basis of the judgment was an open norm of national tort law. In 2017 followed an interesting judgment in another tort law case, the Swedish Magnolia case. It was lost by the environmentalist claimants because they had failed to substantiate the damages they would suffer. But both on first and on second instance, the courts did seem to accept that climate change would fall within the scope of articles two and eight of the European Convention on Human Rights. In the same year, another judgment was rendered in Norway, also causing the environmentalists to lose, but emphasizing that the Norwegian constitutional provision on the right to the environment, Article 112, is justiciable. Thus, it can be invoked against the Norwegian government. And this vision was, by the way, uh, recently affirmed by the Court of Appeal in Oslo. A true breakthrough then occurred with the Court of Appeals judgment in the Dutch Urgenda case in 2018, basing its order to the, judge, to, to the Dutch government to increase its uh, climate change mitigation efforts directly this time on Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human, of Human Rights. And this was also confirmed by the Supreme Court of the Netherlands. So you see this push of uh, this environmental constitutionalism getting more and more shape throughout the timeline of these cases. But then lastly, I would like to mention that this, the reasoning of the claimants in a climate case against the EU goes even further. This claim puts forward that the invoked fundamental rights can be violated through the effects of climate change separately from exceeding the temperature goals that are enshrined in the UNF, C and the Paris Agreement. And this is actually contrasting with the judgment of appeal, um, sorry, the judgment of the Court of Appeal in the Urgenda case, because that has established a violation of the international human rights uh, to life and to private life, using the temperature goals in international climate change law to determine the level of discretion uh, that was allowed for the Dutch government. So you see that there, it, the, this environmental constitution is taken even further. Now, all this uh, Laura, leads I'm, me... I'm so sorry, but can There's I... There's only I one sentence. So Very all good. this... 
This is the trouble is that the moderator can't see what's in the notes in front of the speaker. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, so I have only, only one sentence uh, left, but you can see my PowerPoint, can you? I can't and see if you're at the bottom of it. Please go on. Okay, anyway, so uh, all this leads me to conclude that uh, climate change litigation uh, indicates, a, indicates a growing consensus that a sound environment forms a constitutional norm and is therefore a prerequisite for democracy to, to be protected by judges. Now, I look very much forward to the discussion uh, and to any kinds of questions, remarks, or criticisms that you may have. And please also feel free to email me afterwards at uh, my email address indicated here. I hope you can then see it. It's l.e.burgers at uva.nl. Thank you very much for your attention. Laura, th thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also for the very modest way in which you responded to the fact that I had given you already a title, which I am very sure you will not be long in acquiring. Thank you for that. Thanks. I move on now to uh, our third speaker, who is Dr. Christoph Sobota, uh, who is going to talk to us about recent Court of Justice case law on air quality. Now, actually, Dr. Sobota for me is not a colleague uh, who is a remote and unknown colleague because he works for my advocate general colleague, Advocate General Cocotte at the Court of Justice of the European Union. And he has a very long serving referendaire with Advocate General Cocotte because he's been with her since 2003 and has assisted her in more than 100 cases, in particular the area of environmental law. It is his fault, I say this, this is not in my notes, it is his fault that I have found it so difficult to get my hands on environmental cases <laughs> because he does them with Advocate General Cocotte and he does them very well indeed. He has spoken and published on many issues of EU law, in particular on EU environmental law, on data protection and constitutional law, as well as on the Court of Justice. Dr. Sabota, you have the floor. Well, <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. I'll be talking about, uh, about air quality jurisprudence of the Court of Justice, which is, well, it depends on whether you are a class half full or class half empty type. For me, it's more class half full. It's, it's a bit of a success story in our jurisprudence because um, in my opinion, we are quite effective in this area, at least we have been, we, we've been quite effective recently. But you could, of course, also criticize our jurisprudence as being insufficient. Well, let's see what I will be talking about. I will start by presenting a little bit our legislation on ambient air quality so that you understand what I will be talking about. And then I will address two uh, prongs of, of enforcing this, this legislation. The first one is infringement proceedings by the Commission, and the other one is the bottom-up enforcement through the Member State Courts and bringing references from these courts to our court. Um, what is our air quality legislation? Well, with regard to air quality, there are a lot of EUs. We have classical end-of-pipe standards, uh, for example, the Industrial Emissions Directive. We have fuel quality standards. What we burn obviously has impacts on air quality. Um, we even have general emission budgets. For example, the National Emission Ceiling Directive sets up global budgets for certain pollutants. And I think there's something similar also on, on uh, climate change relevant gases, which is another legal act of the EU. But I will be talking about ambient air quality. Ambient air quality means that uh, the EU has set up limit values of the quality of the air that is around us, that we are breathing if we are outside. There were uh, a number of limit values set up by, uh, oops, sorry, but set up by, uh, by this legislation. Uh, you see it on the slide, sulfur dioxide, PM10, which is particles, dust, uh, lead, carbon monoxide, PM2.5 is even smaller dust, it's even more dangerous. Um, but it's not yet, uh, as far as I'm aware, 
can be effective in contrast to the larger dust PM10. This has been in force since 2005. And the other important one is nitrogen dioxide, which has been in the force since, since 2010. Even though there wasn't a possibility for member states to extend this deadline by five years, so at least in, since 2015, these values have to be respected. Um, how do we find out whether these limit values are respected? Well, there are um, measuring stations uh, set, set up under the directive, and th these need to be on one hand representative, on the other hand, they need to be set up where the highest values are to be ex uh, expected, and these values need to be respected almost everywhere in within the member states. So um, if you have one high point, then already you might, might be in breach of the limit values. In addition, once a limit values is breached, this is already a breach of EU law, um, member states have an obligation to uh, do something about it, to enact air quality plans, which should aim to keep this exceedance as short as possible. Uh, the air quality should be within parameters as soon as possible. Um, so, uh, the main problems are PM10 since 2005 and NO2. PM10 is more problem in the eastern member states where, um, for example, uh, lignite or wood is used for heating. Um, therefore, we have cases against Bulgaria or Poland, for example. NO2 is a problem for um, cities in the old member states where there's a lot of automobile traffic, in particular with diesel engines. Um, and most of these older member states are affected, Germany, France, or the UK, for example. Um, if you hear about diesel engines, you already realize this is a very challenging task to comply because you might have to introduce prohibitions or reduce diesel traffic in cities, and uh, this is politically very, very challenging. So member states are not that keen to comply uh, out of their own motivation, <laughs> even though at least there are calculations that thousands of deaths are related to exceedances uh, of the air quality rules, even in Western Europe, where the problem is certainly much smaller than in other parts of the Earth. So um, one of the ways to enforce this are infringement proceedings. These are proceedings that can be brought by the EU Commission in Brussels against member states for finding that a member state has not compliant with obligations under EU law. And if even after such a judgment, the member state still does not comply with EU law. The Commission can start a second procedure uh, asking our court to impose a lump sum or recurring penalty payment on the member states to comply with, with the obligations. Um, on the bottom, you see examples on, on waste. There was a 40 million lump sum imposed on Italy for illegal landfills that were not cleaned up. And then the recurring payment every six months of another 40 million uh, that was to be reduced for each clean land of landfill. The cases from 2014, and even last year, there were still 40 landfills to be cleaned up, and Italy had to pay 8 million euros, as, at least to my calculation. A similar case was against Greece with smaller numbers. Uh, so the Commission started to bring such actions against member states. You see the first three here. Um, but when you look at the outcome, you will realize, oh, these cases are um, not really that helpful if you want to enforce the obligations, because the court only found in a certain year air quality was bad in a member state. And what can you do about it? Member states cannot go back in time, and therefore the court will not impose anything on them uh, in these cases. So the commission had to go back to the drawing board and think again how to enforce this. And this was the leading case, uh, how to make this operational against Bulgaria. Um, they did a two-prong approach. The, one, the first prong was they said this infringement of limit values is not isolated and limited to a certain year. It is continuous and systematical because for a number of years each year, the limit values were breached. Um, and the court agreed and said, yes, this is continuous and systematical. And this means that further infringement in the future may be other examples of the, of the same infringement. And so, so in theory, it might be possible to enforce this by way of an enforcement action and the imposition of uh, payments on the member state. Um, they had the second problem as well. They said, well, the fact that you pro broke all your uh, limit values um, indicates that the, the plans that you've adopted to improve the situation were not sufficient. 
Um, and the court said, well, yes, it's true. There is a certain amount of discretion for member states. The balance needs to be struck. But uh, as there has been a continuous breach, this is self sufficient indication that the plans were not sufficient. So um, in order to comply with this problem, member states will have to su submit sufficient plans uh, to improve the air quality. This approach was then confirmed a little bit later in, against Poland and then the commission introduced uh, more cases. We had got a judgment last year against France, another one this year against Romania. And now we have seven more cases pending in court, um, which will also increase the pressure on these member states. But you already see this is a very slow approach. It takes very long to, to achieve results this way if member states are not really eager to comply. So it's very important that there's another way to, to put pressure on member states. This is through national courts. People go to the national court and ask that EU law is applied. And here in this case, a, a German guy, Mr. Janicek from the Green Party, um, lives near this road in Munich and says air quality is bad. It does not comply with the directive and went to court. Um, the breach was clear. Um, and yet Mr. Janicek asked for the plan that was required. Under German law, it's not that easy uh, to obtain a judgment saying the administration or the state needs to adopt the plan. Um, and uh, that's why the German Supreme Administrative Court asked our court whether under EU law citizens can ask for such a plan. The German doctrine says, well, such a plan would be in the general public interest, and this would be for the public authority to enforce, not for individuals. Um, the court dealt very easily with this case, looked at the obligation in the directive and asked whether it would have direct effect. To have direct effect, such an obligation needs to be sufficiently clear and unconditional. Uh, and this was the case, it was clear that such, such a plan needed to be adopted. Problems might be with the details of the plan, but these were not in dispute in this case. In this, this case was only about whether the, there was an obligation, was a right to have such a plan. And therefore, the court said, yes, this is, has direct effect that individuals also have a legitimate interest in a healthy environment, and therefore they can ask for the enforcement of EU provisions that aim to protect uh, the environment and so, uh, aim to uh, uh, create a healthy environment. And therefore, um, Mr. Janicek won. The case went to the UK, well, not the case, the problem went to the UK where an NGO tried to do the same thing. Um, the situation there was very, very uh, complicated and, and uh, also very problematic. 40 of 43 zones were in breach of NO2 limit values, and the UK was planning to put it right, but they had a very, very long time horizon. And so Giant Earth went to UK courts and said, well, this must go faster. Please do an injunction against the UK government to comply with the limit values as soon as possible and at the latest by 2015. They did not have success in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. One of the main lines of opposition was that the court said, well, this is a very political question, how to achieve these limit values, that's not for the courts to decide. The court, the case went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court then made reference to our court. Our court said, yes, it's true, plans involve an element of discretion, but nevertheless, this discretion is limited by the objective that the exceedance must be as short as possible. And therefore, courts must look at such plans and must take any me measure necessary such as an order in a, the appropriate terms so that the authority establishes the plan. And the outcome of this, you see here, uh, you can read it for yourself, you can find these cases on the internet. The High Court is, was now looking very deeply into the details of such plans and uh, uh, whether they were sufficient or not. And, and um, from what I read in these cases, the preferred measure now in the UK are congestion charges that you put on diesel cars entering city centers. Uh, so it seems there has been a bit of an advance this way in the UK. Um, back to Germany, back to Bavaria. You remember the first of the two cases was from Bavaria. And the gov regional government in Bavaria says, well, um, we, we really don't want to ban diesel cars from our cities. No, we won't do this. 
They have other measures uh, that they are adopting, but it's quite clear that this, these measures will not lead to a solution in the near future. And so the local Supreme Administrative Court said, okay, I want to force you to do something. And what our rules allow me to do is to impose penalty payments, very low penalty payments of up to 10,000 euros on the administration. And they imposed two payments of 4,000 euros each. Um, and then these payments were made. They were paid from the environmental authorities to the regional Ministry of Finance. And you can imagine the regional government said, well, um, no, we are not changing our mind. We are continuing. So um, then the court said, asked itself, what can I do? And then they asked us, what can I do? Um, and they also, uh, then they mentioned the possibility whether officials, including the regional prime minister, uh, might need to be placed in coercive detention until they adopt the necessary measures. This coercive detention is not explicitly foreseen for cases against the administration, but under civil law, it's possible to do something like this if uh, this is an action that only the, the uh, other party in the court case can do. And if they are obliged to do it and don't do it, then they might be posed, put into coercive detention of the last measure that is possible. What did our court do? Well, our court said, well, member states, of course, enjoy certain procedural autonomy. There are no specific rules on enforcement in EU law that might resolve this issue. But uh, when member states regulate the procedure, they are subject to the principles of equivalence, equivalence and effectiveness. For us, it's about effectiveness. And of course, if a judgment cannot be enforced, uh, then the right to an effective remedy is, is severely affected. Um, it, it's, well, for me as a German lawyer, is, this case is a shame because it demonstrates that our legal system doesn't work properly in this case. So uh, something must be done. The instruments that EU law offers in the, such cases is interpretation and conformity. Member state courts must interpret their internal law in a way uh, that might help to achieve uh, the objectives of EU law. Um, there's a dispute in Germany whether this is possible in this case. Um, and if this is not possible, then they must disapply any provision that is contrary to EU law. And now we think, okay, there might be a clear path towards uh, detention here. But um, there's also something else to take into account. Uh, the right to liberty of these officials, um, which is set down in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, and this must not be infringed either. So you can, you can do coercive detention if there's a sufficient legal basis uh, here in this case in member state law. Um, but this again is for member state courts to decide. And even if you have such a basis, you also have to respect the principle of proportionality. Is it really uh, proportionate to put people in jail about this? Um, and the issue that you might must be looking at here is, is there a less restrictive measure? And you will see there is something uh, that could be done in the next slide. Um, but it was not developed in Bavaria. In Bavaria, the case recently, just last week, ended more or less because the authorities adopted a new plan, still without these bans, but uh, the, the, the Bavarian court said, we have to look again at this and start the whole enforcement procedure again, if it's not sufficient. But in the neighboring region of Baden-Württemberg, right next door to Bavaria, courts it discovered a, a, a less severe means to uh, enforce these rules, and they, enforced, uh, they ordered a one-time penalty of 25,000 euros, and this was not paid to the regional ministry of finance, but to an NGO. And apparently as a consequence of this, uh, the regional government now intends to comply with, uh, with the court judgments. Um, and even more interesting, a uh, little bit later in France, uh, a 10 million, million fi uh, fine per semester was imposed uh, until clean air, air is achieved. But in France, the situation is different, different. If I understand the judgment correctly, this is explicitly foreseen as a mode of enforcing uh, obligations on the, uh, against the administration. But what is new is that this is the highest amount that has ever been imposed on the French administration in any case. Um, it's still unclear who receives this money. It might be that the uh, NGO that brought the case receives the money, but it might also be other NGOs or some independent state body. And finally, there's another a way to achieve this in Italy at least. Um, 
the a special commissioner can be appointed to adopt the necessary measures. But again, you would probably need a legal basis for this. And this was all. I'm a little bit over time, so I'm sorry about this, but thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Sabota. Dear Christoph, thank you for that <laughs> and for the usual clarity in your exposition. We come last but not least to Dr. Henry Schuchens. I apologize if I've just massacred your surname. Uh, he is a postdoctoral assistant and lecturer in Ghent University, where he teaches public international law and diplomatic law. And he has published several articles and book chapters in relation to topics such as the environmental impact assessment, the air quality legislation, access to justice, climate change, and sustainable development. And he is going to talk to us about recent case law on strict species protection. Dr. Schulkens, please. Um, I will, in my presentation, I will uh, focus on EU species protection law. Um, I've also included a subtitle, when uh, the law meets emotions and science, I could also be telling uh, a fairy, a fairy tale, a very uh, well-known European fairy tale about uh, a young girl and a big bad wolf, because this is the one of the underlying themes which is currently reappearing in the case law of the European Court of Justice when it comes to uh, strict species protection law. Um, wait. Yes, um, but basically I want to first address the general backdrop of EU species protection law and that is that we are currently witnessing a sixth extinction wave on our planet and the European Union is no exception to that general rule. There are several reports that have been uh, issued by European Environmental Agency and they consistently underline that the majority of the species that are present on the European continent are are currently in an unfavorable conservation status, which means that their survival in the long term cannot be taken uh, for granted. So uh, in my presentation, I will um, adopt a three-pronged approach. First, I will address the, the major questions, regulatory and policy societal challenges that emerge when uh, considering and discussing uh, species protection law. I will secondly also address and contextualize the system of strict species protection, which is included in the articles 12 and 16 of the Habitats Directive. And thirdly, I will address um, several of the most recent ruling decisions of the European Court of Justice uh, dealing with uh, major interpretation questions when applying article 12 and 16 of the Habitats Directive. I'm well aware that um, there is also a system of strict species protection, which is included in the birds directive. But uh, since I've only been uh, accorded uh, 15 minutes, uh, I will not be able to address this uh, during this presentation. So uh, let me first present you with three underlying general questions which should be addressed when talking about EU species protection. And I will do this by introducing a three uh, distinct species to you. First species that I will introduce to you is the, the wild hamster. It was recently included uh, in the uh, list with endangered species of the uh, international, uh, of the IUCN as, as, as a species which is now to be considered critically endangered. This species was uh, at the begin, beginning of the 20th century in Europe, in Central Europe, it was considered to be a pest. And now it's critically endangered in my own region, the region of the Flemish region. It is threatened with extinction. We only have 200 individual, left, individual specimens left, which means that this rodent species is to be considered functionally extinct. While at the same time, the few remaining populations of this species are causing havoc because they still pose legal obstacles to project development. Because, For instance, I've included uh, a press article relating to the French population of wild hamster, which is blocking the construction of, in, of, of an, a motorway. And in the Netherlands, several lawsuits have been launched 15 years ago, uh, trying, which tried to challenge, uh, that tried to challenge the construction of an industrial estate, because this was deemed to go contrary to the protection of one of the last remaining population of Dutch wild hamsters. 
but the more elusive species, which has recently uh, co came, come forward in the case of the European Court of Justice, is, is the gray wolf. And uh, this might um, surprise some of the viewers, but until recently, the gray wolf was also almost e extinct uh, within Central Europe. But due to the protection of the Habitats Directive, uh, the, the wolves have recolonized Germany. France, and now we even have wolves in Belgium, Flanders, which is a highly urbanized region, also the Netherlands, Denmark. And this, of course, gives rise to questions relating to coexistence, because wolves from time to time, they predate on livestock, they eat sheep from time to time. And so questions relating to hunting and the protection of public health uh, arise and need to be addressed by the law. So who is afraid of the big wet wolf? And last question, my third question relates to toads and newts. And these toads and newts, they're very small, tiny animals, but they're still capable of blocking housing development projects in the UK. In the Netherlands, we recently had a case where the expansion of a Formula One circuit was uh, challenged um, with reference to the presence of Natajek toads. And in the UK, you even had uh, have companies which focus or their major brand is the, con the producing fence fences in order to keep out these toads and nudes from potential housing sites. So if we now turn to the legal protection we see and uh, uh, it has already been addressed by Charles-Hubert Born that we have the EU Habitats Directive. It was adopted in the year 1992. It has two pillars and this is important to understand. The area protection which has been addressed by Charles-Hubert Born uh, relates to protected sites, but there is also a second pillar, and this second pillar is devoted to the protection of a certain number of highly endangered species, such as the wild hamster, such as the natajack toads, such as uh, the gray wolf. And these species are protected against a number of direct threats, such as killing, such as capture, such as disturbance, such as the deterioration of their breeding sites. So basically, member states are required to prohibit this, all these uh, potentially uh, harmful activities. However, member states can still um, bypass this protection regime, but only if they comply with the uh, derogation clause, which is present in Article 16 of the Habitats Directive. And pursuant to this derogation clause, member states can grant permits in order uh, whenever certain uh, um, specific reasons are being invoked. For instance, one can uh, allow for the hunting of certain species whenever it is aimed at preventing serious damage to livestock. Uh, one can, for instance, issue a derogation in order to capture uh, a dangerous animal whenever it constitutes an, uh, a danger for public health. So these are the grants for derogations, which are listed by Article 16 of the Habitats Directive. So basically, the species that are listed on Annex 4 of the Habitats Directive are strictly protected, but member states can still issue derogations under very restrictive circumstances. So let's now take a look at the recent case law developments before the European Court of Justice. And it, um, I can echo what Charles-Hubert Born has already stated. We do note that the Court of Justice is, is uh, clearly um, uh, eager to underline the, the effectiveness of the protection regime. And I will demonstrate this. Uh, um, first of all, um, I will demonstrate this through a case which concerns uh, sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles are, the Careta Careta sea turtles are uh, highly endangered. They're still present in uh, Greece. However, the um, they, their nesting sites are being endangered, are being threatened by the construction of houses, by the development of touristic facilities. And Greece has been on several occasions been unwilling to comply with the system of strict protection. And the European Commission has taken Greece um, to the Court of Justice uh, by virtue of an infringement proceeding. And in this case law, the Court of Justice, uh, most recently in a ruling of the year 2016, has underlined that the Article 12 of the EU Habitats Directive, which lays down the system of strict species protection, is not merely to be in, transposed in, in, in the legal 
system of our member states in the legislative framework, but it also needs to be applied in the field, on the ground. So member states really need to make sure that these strict protection rules are effectively ensuring that um, the protected species are no longer threatened by uh, these, all these potential dangerous uh, and harmful activities. So basically, the Court of Justice underlines the preventative effect, and it also underlines the wide scope of the protection regime, because Article 12 does not exhaustively list a number of potentially dangerous uh, harmful activities. It merely states that every type of activity which might contradict or might lead to the killing of an animal or to the destruction of a resting place should be prohibited. So housing activity, um, ongoing uses, recreational activities, all these activities need to be regulated whenever they might conflict with the uh, protection or the recovery of a protected species. Of course, when we take into account Article 12 of the, the Habitats Directive, it is noted there that only deliberate disturbance is prohibited. Only deliberate uh, capture of these species is uh, prohibited. So the question then arises, what does, does that exactly entail? Deliberate disturbance, deliberate capturing. And I've included here a picture of uh, an otter. Uh, one of the cases in which the court deals with this related to otters that were victim to the use of snares. And these snares were used in Spain in order to, to, to capture foxes, which are not strictly protected under EU species protection law. And the question then arose whether this, is, whether this constitute a deliberate disturbance or a deliberate capture. And in general, the court stated that in order to interpret this, a deliberate, the, the requirement of deliberateness, uh, a general intent is sufficient. So whenever there is general information that, for instance, on a site, protected species are present and you still continue uh, with your harmful recreational activities, then you're infringing, then, you're, um, then you commit an offense against the protection regime. The same goes for deliberate capture. Whenever you have accepted the possibility of capturing or killing a protected species, then you are committing an offense against the, the backdrop of Article 12 of the Habitats Directive. And even more so, the court has also underlined that when it comes to the protection of breeding sites and resting places, that not only deliberate activities are to be prohibited, but also uh, activities um, which are lawful under planning law, but still might lead to the destruction of resting sites or of breeding space, uh, spaces for protected animals. And the court has ruled that this does not is not disproportionate because it helps to conserve and to ensure the effectiveness of the system of sixth protection for these endangered species. In a uh, recent ruling of uh, July 2020, an interesting case arose with respect to uh, wild hamsters. While the wild hamster is critically endangered, this rodent species has quite ironically managed to adapt itself to a, an urban environment. And they are present in the city of Vienna. And in this context, a project developer wanted to construct uh, a housing facility on a specific plot of land. And, um, but hamsters were present on this plot of land, according to the uh, Austrian uh, authorities. So he was charged with criminal offenses. And he stated that he did not commit a criminal offense because the resting places and breeding sites, the burrows of the hamster, were abandoned. And then the question arose, does the system of strict protection of Article 12 of the Habitats Directive, does it also apply to abandoned uh, sites, abandoned resting places? And the court stated that, yes, it does. Even resting places which are no longer occupied by a protected species are still protected or are to be protected whenever there exists a sufficient high uh, probability that the species will return to such places. So this is to be backed up by ecological science. So if there, is, uh, if there are reports that can demonstrate that hamsters are frequently uh, using these resting places, then they are also protected even when the hamster is not, or the protected species is not uh, uh, present there. And this brings me to another case which relates to the presence of large carnivores in urban and human settlements. Because with the return of large carnivores in Western Europe, also wolves suddenly pop up in the middle of 
human settlement. The question then arises, are these wolves still protected whenever they venture out and stray into uh, villages and, and cities? And the court recently had to deal, the European Court of Justice, with such a case relating to a Romanian wolf, which had popped up in a Romanian village and was later captured by Romanian authorities because they considered him uh, the, the wolf to, con, uh, to constitute a danger for public safety, but they had not issued a derogation. So basically the Romanian authorities stated, yeah, but if the wolf's, wolf was not present within a protected site, it is no longer protected. The court uh, most importantly disagreed. It stated that whenever a protected species strays close or into human settlements, the, this human settlement is to be considered uh, as a part of its natural range. So wolves do not lose their protection whenever they venture out of the boundaries of a, prote of a protected site. And the court added that this is only logical because due to the human impact on the environments, certain species adapt and, and also adapt their behavior to human settlement. So it would be illogical to, um, to, to rule that, that wolves and other species would lose their legal protection simply by the simple fact that they uh, venture out into human settlements. Okay, I just wanted to um, underline five take home messages. So the case law underlines that the Court of Justice is very aware of the effective application of the system of strict protection. It underlines the wide scope of the protection regime. Derogation clauses are to be uh, strictly interpreted a restoration-based approach uh, is uh, in order when applying and interpreting the system of strict protection. And uh, when you, you apply for derogations or you uh, enter into decision-making processes, this needs to be based on rigorous science. So this were my five take-home messages. Thank you. I'm sorry for not uh, respecting the time slot. On the contrary, thank you very much. And I'm sorry to have had to be brutal and uh, cut you short. Let us turn, please, to the questions. And uh, we, we have a, a question for uh, Laura Burgers, which is whether when you have climate change cases in states that deny knocker standi to challenges against state inaction on climate change, can those cases be brought in human rights courts, such as, for example, the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, under Article 13? What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, uh, first a disclaimer, I'm not an expert per se in the case law of, or in the law of the European Court of, European Court of Human Rights, but in, I can say something about this question. Um, so in the cases that I have researched, standing was never denied. It was always challenged. Uh, but I actually think that it was uh, a reason for the, for instance, the environmental NGO Urgenda to include individual claimants as well in the case to be able to um, take the, the case to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. And perhaps I can also add something on this more, namely that the right to an effective remedy actually did play, because that was, I think, mentioned also by this question, did play a role also in the reasoning of the Supreme Court judgment because the Dutch state had argued that, well, everybody is contributing to climate change and the Netherlands is contributing only little, an argument that also comes back in other cases. So uh, yeah, why are we, um, why should we be liable here? And then the Supreme Court of the Netherlands invoked the right to an effective remedy saying that, well, if this argument would be accepted, that means there's no remedy against, um, yeah, violations of people's rights that are, res are the result of climate change. One other last remark, it is also interesting that the Supreme Court in the Netherlands could have used, I think it's protocol number 16, and ask, ask for an advisory opinion to the European Court of Human Rights, but it did not do so due to time pressure, I think mostly, because, um, well, this case was concerned with a climate mitigation goal for the year 2020, and it's the Supreme Court rendered its decision last December, so it didn't want to wait any longer, I think. Thanks. Th thank you for that very helpful answer. If I may say just for a moment from my experience as a practitioner from before I went to the court as a member of the court, 
on the whole, law tends to get somewhere because people are prepared to take chances and try things out that haven't been tried yet. You know, if you just look at the book of what's worked in the past, you'll always be one step behind where in fact you can go. And the other point was, I, I was thinking, I was agreeing with you very much that if you have individual claimants and also a group, sometimes that helps to get you through the door in Strasbourg because you can demonstrate more clearly that the person concerned is, is affected adversely. And I, I had experience of that as a, as a practitioner, but not in an environmental case. Let me go to another question. Uh, this, time, uh, this time I wanted to put a question that had come in for uh, Dr. Charles Born, Charles Hubert Born. Uh, we're asking you, could you elaborate please on the definition of irreversible damage and interim measures and how those two interrelate with each other uh, and the questioner points out that there are known cases where even the building of a highway was perceived as being reversible. So how does this one actually work as between irreversible damage and whether or not you grant interim relief? Thank you very much. This is a very important question. Uh, it relates to the, the concept of urgency in the interim measure uh, procedures. And, and uh, the court and the commission uh, developed, uh, well, an interesting uh, uh, argumentation about the irreversible character of the, the, the damage caused by the uh, forest management uh, measures taken by the Polish uh, authorities. As um, indeed, the, 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 the Polish authorities um, claim that they were um, fighting a, a pest, actually, the, the spruce beetle, um, which uh, was uh, referred to as a, as a, as a pest which, uh, who, 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 which, which destroyed the, the forest of the Yellow Visa. But uh, um, the commission and the court, uh, the court stand, uh, stated that uh, the, the transformation of a, a natural forest and an ancient forest, an old growth forest was irreversible, of course, as uh, if you uh, log the, the whole forest or, or, or parts of it, uh, it would be uh, impossible to restore uh, an ancient forest with the same ecological characteristics and the same habitats for uh, old growth habitats and forest uh, related species. So um, this was the main um, argument uh, uh, that the court uh, uh, retained for um, uh, taking uh, the interim measures and, and, and uh, uh, recognized that uh, there was an urgency uh, which uh, allowed for such measures. So I think that the, 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 the um, the possibility to restore the habitats is a, is a very important uh, criteria to uh, decide whether um, the damage is irreversible uh, regarding habitat protection. And I think it's a very scientific um, and sound uh, argument, I think. And, and it's again, that is again um, a, a, a sign uh, of the way the court is dealing with science in conservation cases. And, and it's very interesting to, to, uh, to have this case because the, the Bialovisa uh, forest is one of the uh, primary, the, the, the very few primary forests in, in Europe. So uh, it was very interesting to, to, to uh, and very relieving to, to, uh, to hear the court um, uh, to, uh, saying that this damage was irreversible and, and, and of course, uh, uh, subject to, to interim measures. So I, I think that was a science-based uh, uh, order. It's also very nice to hear of a case where you think my court absolutely got it right. Of That's course. good to hear. <laughs> Can I move on to a question for Christophe Sobota from Jean-Luc Fauré? Uh, this is the sort of question that I would have hated if I'd found it as a student on an exam paper, because you're being asked, is the Aarhus Convention the right tool for the citizen to enforce the precautionary principle? <laughs> Yeah, um, the Aarhus Convention is always one of the important tools to enforce environmental law, but uh, I have real difficulties 
with the idea of enforcing uh, the, the precautionary principle as such a freestanding, as a freestanding principle. What you certainly can do is uh, you can rely on specific provisions of EU environmental law uh, and then use the precautionary principle as a tool for the interpretation of these rules. And we had uh, at least one rule where I'm certain that the court used this, uh, what Ms. Professor Baum presented to us, Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive was interpreted in the light of the precautionary principle. And if you find such rules with regard to the specific problem that you are addressing, and then of course the precautionary principle is something that you can use to help you and to help you get EU law into court, then the Arms Convention certainly is helpful, in particular if you are an NGO. Um, if you are an individual, it might be more difficult. <laughs> right. Now, I'm going to move to a question, which is a question, in fact, for all panelists. And I'm going to warn uh, Dr. Henrik Schokens that since we haven't yet asked him a question, he is going to start with the answer to this question for everyone, right? And I'm going to ask everyone to be, please, short, if you can be, in answering this question. The question is, what are your views on recognizing the legal personality of animals and of nature generally? And if you think it's effective, how can this recognition be, be expedited so that we regularly see private litigation brought by national ent natural entities. It's a sort of development of the do trees have rights question, but it's very nicely put. So let's start off, if we may please, with uh, Dr. Shulkins, with Henrik. What well, do you feel? You. Well, uh, first of all, I think that um, going back to the should trees have rights uh, analogy and, and Christopher Stone uh, famous article, and also the case law of the, in, the, in the US, there you had a very interesting case relating to a bird species, the Palila bird ruling, uh, in which the Endangered Species Act was invoked. And the Endangered Species Act is, is similar to the Habitat Directive. It, it grants certain legal protection to endangered species. And there the court accepted a lawsuit which was brought in the name of the bird. Not, at, not on behalf of the NGO, but the NGO acted on behalf of the bird. And the, bird, uh, the court reasoned that basically uh, by granting certain legal protection to the, the bird, basically you're also, as, as the, the other side of the coin, you're also granting it certain rights. Uh, so this was a, a very uh, obscure ruling and it has not been repeated afterwards, but it might offer uh, an interesting uh, pathway into uh, rec the, the recognition of certain legal rights on behalf of certain strictly protected species. Because of course, if you cannot kill a wolf, does a wolf has a right, enjoy the right not to be killed? Let, let's go across, the, let's see who, who picks up the next, uh, the next animal and defends them. I, you're very keen on wolves and I love your pictures of wolves. But let's see, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Charles-Hubert Borne, what do you feel about animals' personality? Well, um, I feel a, a bit um, uh, mixed about it, uh, actually. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure um, it is necessary to grant uh, animals uh, subjective rights. Uh, in order to protect them in justice. I think that there are already some representatives for um, biodiversity uh, assets like NGOs, of course, but also naturalist people, uh, individual uh, citizens uh, who could already um, f file uh, uh, suits uh, against uh, public authorities or even private uh, companies for damaging uh, uh, nature. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure it is necessary, but of course, philosophically, it's a completely different question and I'm quite sensitive to uh, the, the, the movement for animals uh, recognition as sensitive uh, beings, uh, 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 but it's a different question uh, in, in my opinion. It is indeed a different question. Uh, Laura Borges, what do you feel? Well, thanks. Um, well, I'm actually very excited about this movement uh, of um, 
nature obtaining more and more often its own rights. And I would perhaps disagree. I think it is actually quite necessary um, because currently we live in, I think we are all captured in a paradigm where we totally do not recognize in law how much intertwined in, and interconnected and interdependent we are with the world around us. And I think that there is a large paradigm shift needed. And rights of nature, I think, is one answer to that. The only problem is, I think, with all legal personalities is that they create such sort of they actually do not allow so much, at least not in, the, in its current uh, state, for recognizing all this relational, they all the relations, but they, legal personality, I feel, is very much created to separate entities from each other. So I hope to have better answers to this question in a few years from now, because it's really uh, my next research project. We, we shall have to make sure that somebody runs the seminar to get you to come back to help answer that question in a few years' time. And finally, uh, Dr. Christoph Sobota. Christoph, what do you feel? Uh, in thinking, uh, trying to imagine what would be the advantage of granting rights to nature compared to NGOs acting for nature as now. Um, and I, I might even see a potential disadvantage if we draw the analogy with uh, incapacitated, incapacitated people that we appoint people who take care of them and who exercise their rights for them. And so we might in principle have to appoint guardians for nature and uh, this might, e might in, in the end limit the circle of people who might be allowed to bring actions on behalf of nature um, because there's one guardian and if this guardian doesn't want to act, the NGO next door perhaps can't act because it's the guardian's position to act. Um, but that's really theoretical. Another uh, idea that, that came to me was we might arrive at a certain point where certain animals, for example, apes or even wolves or dolphins might be recognized as having a personality and having real rights, more or less in similar or at least close to human rights. And this, this was, would change the whole situation obviously completely. <laughs> Absolutely it would. I have been told by our, by, by, uh, our very, very nice vice chair, by Denise uh, Antolini, that I can ask one more question, which is an all panelist question. And again, it is, a, uh, it is a question, I'm tempted to say it's a question to which the answer should be, that's the topic for the next seminar. Because the question to all panelists is, can you comment on the term judicial activism and the role of judges in urgent cases such as addressing the climate crisis. Do you think courts and tribunals in the EU need to be more active in environmental protection cases? And is that appropriate? And when I ask, is it appropriate? Uh, I, think I, I think I should be turning uh, pretty much immediately uh, to Laura Burgers, uh, who took, gave us a nice philosophical approach and say, right, fit this into your framework for us, please. More activism, less activism, how should we be approaching this? Well, I deliberately choose not to work to use the word judicial activism in my own work because it has this derogative connotation. But I think my work is you can read it as um, indeed an er, yeah, as a plea for judges to be more environmentally activist in one way. Um, yes, and um, well, this case against the European Union, for instance, about the, yeah, that was not, how you say it? It was not determined that it was not accessible. And well, there's a whole debate on that those accessibility requirements that are way too strict, I think, in many respects. So, yeah, that's my answer for now. <laughs> Thanks. Let me, let, me, let me move from you, please, if I may, to uh, my, my colleague's colleague, Dr. Christoph Sabota, because you know that our court is so often accused of being judicially activist. So I think this is a question that someone from our court has to answer, and it's probably not me. So, <laughs> Christoph, over to you. You want to put me on the hot seat here. Um, 
I would say, at least as far as our court is concerned, we need to be very careful where we pick our battles. And uh, I also see the, see the problem that we, we would, in the field of the environment, in particular in the field of climate change, probably reach beyond our technical capacities to really understand what is necessary and what, what needs to be done. Uh, so I'm, I'm a bit skeptical that our court could help a lot in, in these cases, um, at least at the moment. Um, we might be able to act on very specific things, specific infringements of secondary law where specific obligations are, have been set up, but the general case, I, I don't really see that much that we can do. And of course, admissibility of, of actions is, is a huge barrier of it coming to us. Um, but of course, I'm also willing to be convinced. Otherwise, if somebody manages to bring a case into a member state court and this court makes reference to us, uh, developing some idea how to advance climate change by way of court decisions, it might be possible. But at the moment, I don't see it. Thanks for that. Uh, Charles-Hubert Borden, what's, what's, what's your take on this? Um, it's, it's, it's a very tricky question, but uh, judicial activism, in my opinion, is quite um, um, a difficult association of words. I mean, uh, if judges are asked to, to apply the law, uh, I mean, they just uh, apply what the democracy has produced as uh, environmental norms. So uh, I guess that uh, we cannot uh, uh, we cannot say that the judges are activists when they are applying environmental law, including when they are expanding it uh, in order to uh, ensure that the objectives are, meet, are met. So uh, uh, my opinion is that national uh, courts and, and judges should indeed be more audacious in some way, but keeping, of course, in the limits of their powers and in the limit of the separation of powers principle, which is, of course, important, but which can be interpreted as quite, uh, not as a, as a limit uh, to, or, or, or a, an obstacle to uh, audacious decisions like the, the Hague courts did, but rather like uh, a cooperation between judges and, and public authorities. And, and I think in this, in this way, judges can pave the way and, and show the way uh, public uh, authorities could, could, could uh, uh, indeed implement their obligations. So I, I, I'm sure the judges, including the national judges, but also the, of course, the courts of justice have a very important role to pave the way for a low carbon uh, society in the future. So cautious, respectful, but nevertheless room for them to do something, I think is how exactly. I would summarize that. And uh, finally, from our panel, Dr. Henrik Schulkens, what do, what do you feel? Yeah, I agree with uh, what Charles Lubera has uh, just said. I think um, the, the notion of the separation of powers uh, highlights that the power that there is a, a kind of gulf between the powers that the part that there is something to be uh, overcome. Whereas uh, the checks and balances approaches uh, more or less uh, underlines the need to, to collaborate. And I think this is what judges are increasingly doing by rediscovering into existing laws, new interpretations. Or, or um, I think this is the, the task of a judge and this has all, always been the task of a judge. Also in other domains of the law, judges have been consistently reinterpreting uh, uh, old rules into a new societal frame. And I think, for instance, for the Court of Justice, to be more precise, one of the more interesting viewpoints might be the following. We have now, for instance, the Habitats Directive, which basically urges the member states to stave off extinction of certain species. And, and we focus on all these little project developments, these projects, and they, they, they endanger, a, a pond will disappear, a borough of hamsters will disappear in Vienna. And this is this, this reaches the court and, and then we, the court issues its very interesting rulings, but the major threat in the room being climate change is, is also endangering the survival of many of the species that are listed on the habitat directive. So one of the crucial questions to be addressed, hopefully, during the coming decades is the, the following. Will climate change and CO2 emissions in, in essence also be considered as uh, an intervention in nature and therefore also to constitute 
a possible breach of Article 6, 2, and 3 of the Habitat Directive. And this might be a very interesting case because, as Charles Hubert noted, the notion of project is, is being extensively uh, in, uh, is being expanded recently in a court's uh, case law. Uh, and then the question arises, will CO2 emissions also fall within the scope of the notion of project? And if this, if the court would uh, agree with this viewpoint, then I think uh, a lot of new cases might appear before national courts, which might indirectly also push member states to further their um, reduction, uh, reduction efforts and so on and so forth. Thank you. I think it, it's only fair of us you know, serving judiciary if I do not avoid answering this question I just put to the four of you, but perhaps if I make three very short comments. The first comment is that lawyers bring cases before courts. Courts do not uh, jump out there and grab a case. The case has to come before the court. It has to come in in a plausible way. Sometimes the court can be a little bit friendly in terms of admissibility and let something in through the door. But the initiative lies with the lawyers who see the problem, see the potential in the existing legislation and find the enterprise and the energy and the appropriate client to bring the case. So the lawyer has to do his or her job first before the court ever is seized of the matter. Second question, second observation is it does depend a little bit what the text that you're looking at looks like in terms of its drafting. If you have some drafting which is very tight and very precise, by almost by definition, the judge is going to be more constrained in what they can do interpreting that case, that particular text. If, on the other hand, you have the text of, for example, an EU directive, which is the result of compromise between the member states and where a number of key terms have perhaps not been defined, at that stage, of necessity, the court is going to have to make choices as to what legal meaning it attributes to those terms. And I have to say, I was thinking when I was listening to the truly excellent presentation by Charles Hubert Bonne, on the protection of habitats, I was wondering how many people were looking at the words Natura 2000 and then at a series of case numbers which ended like 2017, 2018, 2019, and how many people were saying to themselves, well, you know, for something which was meant to have been organized and set up by 2000, there's an awful lot of unanswered questions still there which are being dealt with by the court. And my third comment is that I don't think, so far as my experience goes, I don't think that law in any area moves linearly. I don't think it moves in a straight line. There are moments when law takes a kind of jump forward and everyone gets very excited. This is really moving. It's moving well. And then there's another decision that comes through which, ah, it doesn't quite fit into that pattern. And you're very, if you're an activist, you're very disappointed because the court missed an opportunity to do something which would have been creative. And there's an appeal and maybe that doesn't go anywhere. But in the meantime, there's another case and there's a little move forward in that area. And so maybe that's helpful. And so I don't think it's linear. And I also would offer the perhaps a rather, a, no, it's not cynical, but a, a sort of, a little weary comment that actually if you're the court you get used to the fact that somebody is not going to like what you just said you know there is always a loser to the party you, you just gave an activist ruling and big industry is up in arms at what you said you didn't give an activist ruling Greenpeace hate you you gave a ruling which upset the member state because that's not how they read the directive they are swearing at you because, well, they hadn't anticipated like that and they'd always implemented on the basis that their meaning was in fact the correct meaning. And now actually they've been told it isn't that. And I suppose I'm really going to suggest that from the perspective of the court, if 
everyone from time to time criticizes what you're doing, maybe you're getting it very roughly and approximately right. Now, with that thought, uh, I'm looking at the time and I'm going to say, sad though I am not to be able to put some more questions, I fear we are running out of time and I'm going to thank the interpreters for their courtesy and being prepared to extend a bit. And I'm going to hand back to Denise uh, Antolini to wrap up the webinar. Denise, you have the floor. Thank you, Advocate General Sharpston. You have been a terrific moderator. <laughs> uh, clever, effective, and, and um, utterly charming, I have to say, in the way that you interwove your remarks with the speaker's remarks. And, and I'm very glad you took time at the end to share your thoughts with us, because it's never fair when you're the moderator that you can't speak. So thank you for those wonderful concluding, concluding remarks. Thank you to all the speakers. It was fascinating from hamsters to, <laughs> to the intricacies of cases. Uh, it was a wonderful webinar with all kinds of insights. And I think as Advocate Gen General Sharpston mentioned, each of these could be many webinars. There's a lot to cover. Let me conclude by saying that I think we are very fortunate to be in this field of law because we have such wonderful colleagues. And I think the warmth and uh, collegiality of this webinar shows that we're, we're doing the right thing, uh, continuing to connect and to share our expertise and to engage globally on these issues. Uh, and as you said, they move forward and back and there's criticism from all sides, but by sticking together, we will make progress. On behalf of the World Commission on Environmental Law and the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment, I thank all of the panelists particularly our amazing moderator, our staff, our interpreters, and all the participants. And with that, let me close by just saying again, thank you very much. We hope to see you at the next webinar. And we're very glad that you continue to engage in these conversations. Thank you. And from Hawaii, aloha.